We're back with our first show since publishing the 2021 preseason fantasy draft guide and the 2021 preseason projection tool. My name is Joe DeSalvo, the voice of the CFF site. And on this show, I'm going to be joined by my partner at the CFF site, Mike Bainbridge, along with two other special guests. And we're going to discuss the latest industry best ball draft that we all participated in about a week and a half ago. We're going to get into draft strategies players that we're looking to avoid, sleepers. We're just going to discuss, discuss the draft in general. But before we do that, just want to welcome you guys back. It's been a long, grueling offseason, but and the news continues to break with transfers now in the first week of June, and we're still getting them week in and week out. But for you guys coming in for the first time, for you guys that do not have any of the preseason content, let's give you a quick rundown real quick. Uh, the preseason fantasy draft guide is out and it is a must if you compete in college fantasy football drafts. All of the preseason homework is done for you. Rankings, we've got player projections. Uh, we discuss uh, a little bit of the schedule. Uh, freshmen, uh, who are some of the sleepers? Who are some of the top transfers? All that and a lot more. 50 plus pages downloadable PDF document. We are constantly updating it throughout the off season. We will do that leading up to the season. It is an absolutely must have if you're a college fantasy football enthusiast. We do play our projections as well. Those are available on a table on the site in the exclusive sections. It's also available in an Excel downloadable file as well. Uh, what we've got this year is a lot more than what the CFF site has always offered. Not only the player rankings, not only the projections. Uh, Mike coming over is going to help out tremendously with the DFS content. He's going to concentrate a lot there at the tail end of the week on getting you guys the DFS articles and get, making you guys money on the weekend. Also with that, we've got the Discord server as well. We've got in, in our first two weeks, we've got over 100 plus folks in that college fantasy football, the CFF site Discord server already, talking everything from DFS strategies to gambling to college fantasy football in general. We've got team pages on there. It is absolutely a must stop place if you play college fantasy football, particularly if you have trouble getting a lot of that news later in the week for injuries. You guys that are already in there in the Discord server, these guys are tremendous. It is basically the college fantasy football community scouring the country every week. Every tidbit of news that they find, they shoot it into that Discord server, and it's all available for you guys. You won't find a better place to be a college fantasy football fan than the CFF site and all of our 2021 exclusive content. Go over to the site, check that out. And for all of you guys that keep coming back year after year after year, you're the reason why we do this show. You're the reason why we make the content better every single year. It's your feedback and it's your support that allows the CFF site to grow. And I am happier now more than ever to be joined by Mike Bainbridge this season. So with that being discussed, that's a lot of what I've just mentioned, what's been going on behind the scenes at the CFF site. I want to introduce you to the guys on this week's show. So welcome in, guys. Here's everyone that I was I was promising you. Uh, there's Mike Bainbridge. Uh, Mike, thanks for joining us tonight. I, I teed you up in the show, man, as, as you and I being together on this over at the CFF site, our first show since we launched the preseason fantasy draft guide. I teed all that up uh, in the opening. So glad that you're with us tonight. We're going to get you on a bunch more shows this year. We're going to make you talk a little bit, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just as long as it's not three hours as that show last year that we did, because that was <laughs> Gotcha. And look, we're, you know, Mike and I are happy to uh, be joined by, by two friends of ours in the college fantasy football industry, Kyle Francis and Eric Froton. Kyle, we'll start with you, man. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Let everyone know where they can find you, what you're working on. Tee yourself up real quick, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Excited to do this. Uh, I've had a chance to be a guest on a few different shows, but actually this is the first time I've ever been able to talk just about college fantasy. Most times I uh, talk a little bit about NFL prospects or you know various other aspects of scouting. So this is really what I love most. And, and so my, my work can be found on DebbieWatch.com. And so kind of like I just said, we work on a, a lot of different aspects of college football as a whole, uh, evaluating it. Right now I'm busy at work doing my uh, conference by conference previews. So that's got me, uh, got me plenty busy. Good stuff, man. Well, look, what about Eric? What about yourself, man? Where can we find you? 
Uh, I know I just, we, we talked a little bit before we came on the air. You did a show uh, the, the, about last week. Um, was it on NBC uh, Edge? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I work for NBC Sports Edge. I did that show you're talking about with Thor Nystrom, where we went over, uh, in our opinion, what were 10 of the most uh, games that just came out for the college football season. We feel we'll get some line value out of, you know, stuff that, that stuck out to us saying, oh, gosh, you know, here's here's, uh, you know, some potential uh, for a look ahead line to be able to get a little bit of value. Um, so, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, last year, as well as this year, I certainly look forward to doing college player props. That was certainly, you know, the, the main gambling column I'd kind of get into. Obviously, college fantasy football, everything uh, having to do with it. And I know that through NBC Sports Edge, we have a best ball draft coming up in early July with a Power 5 and a G5 only best ball, ball drafts that we do every year. So I'm looking forward to, to getting that together for the boys as well. Yep. Good stuff. Well, look, man, we're, we're glad to have you guys. Here's the great thing about tonight's show is that, you know, like last year we had a series of best ball drafts and, you know, uh, the way things unfolded, we never get the, we never got to play out those leagues, obviously, because of COVID and the way everything was, uh, the way the season was affected in regards to the schedule. We're going to bang out a series of four or five more drafts this year. We're going to play these things out, but this is our first show. So, you know, you know, we like to take shots at the guys in the, in the thread that we have. And you guys get to take the first shots tonight. So uh, we're going to kind of go through the draft. We're going we're gonna to look at some of the rosters, some of our picks. Uh, you know, look, feel free to bang on one another, you know, with our words, right? And, it, you know, and, and, and let's have some fun with this, guys. So, um, you know, let's do that. We're, we're going to jump right into it. So, and, and I think it's funny because, or, or interesting, because we're, we've got two guys here that actually had the first two picks. Eric. You had the first pick. So my question with you, and this is probably a real easy one, any consideration whatsoever, any other player than Malik Willis at the one spot? Uh, you know, I, I suppose you can consider it. You know, all options do have to be considered. Uh, if you want to go, if you think it's a better option going with a running back, of course, you think about Brees Hall or Bijan Robinson. But um, given the dual threat ability of Malik Willis, I feel like he is unique in that sense whereas the ability to, uh, you know, run for a thousand yards, throw for maybe 2,500, uh, that would be nice, kind of dependent on how things break for Liberty this year. So um, I, I just felt the due threat ability was just simply too much for me to pass up and, uh, you know, just don't overthink it. Take the cornerstone cornerback, uh, build around him and, and then take skill as the draft unfolded. Yeah. To your point, this is actually just because we didn't really tee this up. The draft we have is 12 teams, 26 man rosters. They're very deep. It is a best ball draft and we do start two quarterbacks. So you go in and getting uh, Malik Wills with your first pick pretty much solidified the foundation for your quarterback spot. And then Mike at, at two for you, I know you and I have spoken quite a bit about who's our number two quarterback behind Malik Willis this year. Uh, I just did a piece that we updated on the guy this past week that really could make a case if you really wanted to for Matt Corral. You went ahead and stamped him as your second pick right there. Any hesitation with that one? A little hesitation. I mean, we think when we discussed Corral versus Rattler, I think it came out pretty close. Um, when you you have a, a two-page deep dive uh, analyzing both of those quarterbacks um, that's now published in the guide, and there's an interesting graph that you posted where you just kind of see Rattler and it's just steady Eddie, right? Just hovers around that 25 to 30 point mark. And I typically will strive for upside when I'm drafting players, regardless of what format in a, in a CFF draft. And you can, and I don't have it up in front of me, but you saw Corral's in the line graph. He was just, um, you know, his upside was right there with, um, Malik Willis from last year and he had you know 40 a couple 40 50 point outings which will win you single-handedly weeks um in any in any uh, CFF draft so I kind of went upside there with uh with Corral yeah and then I, I you know Kyle I was before you I was there in the seventh spot so I'll go ahead and you know I, I selected uh Muhammad Ibrahim for the running back for Minnesota for me uh, I was eyeing a couple of players. I was had my fingers crossed. Uh, obviously, I was hoping that when I saw Brees Hall still on the board after the fourth pick, I was like, okay, you know, it's probably just wishful thinking that he falls for me. He went number five. And I have to tell you, the guy that I was really praying for was going to be David Bell Purdue. He went one pick before me. So 
I went ahead with the running back from Minnesota right there. But, you know, Kyle, drafting with you over the last few years, um, you and I are kind of fans of, of getting those stud wide receivers early. And you did go wide receiver with your first pick, Jalen Tolbert, South Alabama. What were you thinking there? Yeah, so I – ambitiously I guess just to give you uh the full insight into what my cue looked like I mean of course I had to have Malik Willis first I had the 10th pick uh I knew he wasn't knew he wasn't getting there but I I'm an auto drafter so if he gets there and I get him wow it's a miracle uh but I had him and then I had Brees Hall and then I had David Bell Kayshawn Boutte and I had Jalen Tolbert and so I was able to kind of get the guy that I uh had fifth on my board in terms of who I wanted to take at the 10 spot and so you know, he obviously had a massive uh, year last year. And I, I think he's one of those guys that kind of reminds me a little bit, not necessarily in play style, but uh, the scheme and the um, athletic advantage that he has in the group of five, kind of a guy like Michael Gallup. And uh, one of the things that, that I really like about him this year is uh, with uh, Major Applewhite uh, going to South Alabama. If you just look back to some of his receivers uh, at Houston, you know, they had a 98 catch season, another 98 catch season, an 80 catch season with another guy on the team had 76 and then a 75 catch season. And then most recently, he just saw uh, what, what Steve Sarkeesian can do uh, with a guy like Devonta Smith, who caught 117 balls. So I wouldn't say that Tolbert would be my wide receiver one. I think that that would be an error in process to say that he should be, but it wouldn't surprise me if he ascended to that level. Yep. Good point. Now, what's interesting is that the three of you that are on the show all did something different I, that I that I noticed when I was looking at the way the draft played out. Eric, when you nailed down Malik Willis with that first overall pick, you waited you waited not until the ninth round in a two quarterback league before you went with your second quarterback. Was that something? that you were thinking about where you, you got Willis, he was your foundation, you locked in and you were going to wait, or is that just the way things played out for you? Uh, it was a conscious decision. Uh, certainly. I, I feel like with the quarterback class uh, and especially with a 26 round draft, yeah. we really got to see how deep this quarterback pool is because as we'll get to, you know, when we talk about some of my favorite sleepers, there are quarterbacks that I really, really like, there weren't even drafted in here. And most of these teams have either five or six QBs. So it was a conscious decision definitely to take that QB one and then to wait uh, to see who fell that I like, you know, in that QB two range and, uh, and stat take a stab around, you know, nine, 10, 11 uh, in that range. And a point I'd like to bring out about how the drafted, you know, uh, worked out. If you look at, uh, you know, obviously we don't have it here. The people at home can see it, but, what ended up happening is through the first four rounds, you know, there were plenty of QBs taken, you know, essentially we had uh, three taken in the first round. We had five taken in the second round. We had two in the third round and then we had another four in the fourth round. And then in rounds five and round six, there wasn't a single quarterback taken. Yep. No QBs, no tight ends, straight up skill position run. So that's typically what I've seen in, you know, the, uh, the dreaded mock drafts, Joe. But uh, <laughs> uh, just in what I've been doing in this offseason is you'll get that initial burst of the top rung of quarterbacks, you know, tier one, tier two. And then uh, you'll see just teams that have already addressed that need don't have to do it anymore. You're only starting two. And we're starting, I believe, uh, you know, two running backs, three wide receivers and two Flex. Two flexes. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're starting so many skill positions, you're going to see, you know, pretty big prodigious runs. And that's really what we got between five and six. And, uh, and that's why I kind of waited a little bit and, and waited till round nine to take Jerkovic, who uh, I'm really high on. I think the, the entire offense is built around him there. Frank Signetti, uh, Jeff Halfley came in and, and is doing a great job at BC. They're really competitive, but you know, regardless, uh, Kyle did something somewhat similar in that he didn't take a single QB until round nine and he took Clayton Toon, who was one of the guys I was looking at there. And then he followed it up with Keaton Slovis. So, um, you know, both of us somewhat in the similar vein, I, I had to take Willis, but I have no problem waiting for on QBs uh, in a 12 team format. Cause I feel like it's a deep class this year. Well, you actually, you know, you queued up. Uh, I'll go ahead and skip to you, Kyle, because that was going to be my next point. Um, Eric brought it up. You waited to round nine before you even jumped on your first quarterback, but then 
you went with three consecutive quarterbacks, Toon, Slavis, and K.J. Jefferson, Arkansas. I'm assuming that was a conscious decision. Was there no one that really you liked with one of those first two picks, players off the board, and then it's like, okay, I can sit and wait now? Yeah, I would actually prefer not to be in the first couple slots so I wouldn't have to even consider a quarterback because that's my optimal strategy. Um, I would say I'm a little bit different when I play in dynasty formats versus redraft. Uh, I'll be a bit more aggressive and ambitious with quarterbacks, but I guess not to get too far down that road, but it speaks to that my philosophical approach would be I'm always trying to backfill uh, elite quarterbacks that come at a discount, like your Spencer Rattlers when we know he's going to sit a year, um, things like that. So to me, it's always a, a value type thing. And I really felt like, um, uh, I know mo most people don't know this, but I remember one of our drafts last year, I remember what round I waited to, but I think I, I did it just to spite everyone. I think I waited till round 21 to take a quarterback uh, last year. And thankfully we don't have to pull up the results because there's a pandemic. Who knows how that went? Um, Kyle, I think you ended up with Tommy DeVito. And so we all know <laughs> that. <laughs> well, Mike, I, I've got bad news. I just wrote Syracuse's profile and I almost talked myself back into DeVito. Uh, so uh, it, it, anyway, but no, that was, that was a conscious decision for me. I mean, I look at the three guys, the three guys that I got in particular, and I don't think it would be shocking for any of those guys to have a top 12 or top 15 season at, at the position. I mean, there's, there's historical precedent for a, a Holgerson guy to get there, a Bryles guy to get there, and a Graham Harrell air raid guy to get there. So for me, uh, I don't, uh, I knew that I was going to have to take more quarterbacks. I believe I ended up with six total, um, but uh, that, 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 that was the trade off for me. I was able to go tight end a little bit earlier. I took the second tight end off the board in round seven. So I was able to say, hey, I want to lock down an elite tight end. Um, but then I waited a little bit on quarterback. So for me, that's a conscious decision. That's not something I'm probably going to deviate from a whole lot. Yeah, uh, I, I, you know, here's the fun, you know, the fun thing is, is that we kind of, we, we, we learn one another's tendencies when we do so many of these. And, and so I know that, you know, a lot of times you'll target those top receivers. You waited on quarterback last year. It wasn't a surprise, but the reason why I bring it up is because all of us were a little different. You know, Eric, you were like, boom, let me get the first one round nine before you got one. Kyle, you were 9, 10, 11 before you got your quarterback. Mike, you went 1-2 uh, quarterback with Corral and Bryce Young at Alabama. And then, then you started pounding on some of the position players. So, so what were you thinking there with getting your two quarterbacks locked? Um, one rule that I will never deviate from college fantasy football is that quarterbacks will win you the league. They have the highest up scoring upside of any position. So if I can lock down Corral, who is a certified top three quarterback this year, and then someone with the upside, you know, we don't obviously don't know because uh, of the limited sample size how Bryce Young will turn out, but we know the upside of the Alabama offense. If those two guys hit, do I want to say right now that I will win this league, but there's, there's a higher probability if those guys hit that I will win this league because right. of the scoring upside of quarterbacks in college fantasy football league. You know, one thing we didn't even mention, and I'll get into that, is it's upside, right? And I think in these best ball drafts, there's a, there's a little bit of a philosophical difference, and, and we're going to get into that real quick. But I'll, I'll share that because my picks, when you look at – I went with Sam Howell in round two and jumped on Emory Jones in round four, which in some redraft leagues, one could argue that that might be a little too soon for Emory Jones. But, you know, Kyle, this, this kind of goes to your point as well with that South Alabama offense. In these best ball drafts, I'm all about give me the guy with the high ceiling, right? I mean, you look at Sam Howell, he's not going to consistently give you the 40 point games, but you know, he's going 30, he's going at least 36 touchdowns and 3,600 yards in back to back seasons. He's got 40 touchdown, 4,000 yard potential this year. Uh, pairing him with Emory Jones in a Dan Mullen offense, if Emory Jones nails down that spot, Mike, you and I talked about a lot this in the, a lot in the preseason. Dan Mullen, you've got a top 10 quarterback if this guy sticks and turns out the stats that he usually does. And then you've got to go off the board. I think I went into the 20s, Kyle, or maybe even one of the last picks of the draft when I got Jake Bentley for South Alabama. And so, you know, when you look at his receivers, they picked up Daly, the transfer from Kentucky. He's got, they got Colin Lacey in the, in the, in the, in the slot. You've got Tolbert there on the outside, major Applewhite offense in a best ball format. 
there's no doubt in my mind, Jake Bentley is going to be one of my top two quarterbacks at least a few weeks throughout the season. And so I think that'll tee up the next question. We probably should have let off the show with this. You know, you mentioned Kyle dynasty redrafts, your philosophy in best ball drafts kind of give us the four one, one, what you're, what you're thinking in best ball formats, because there's a lot of people. The reason I asked this, there's a lot of people that are probably watching that some have never played best ball formats before. So this may actually help them out. Yeah, I, I think uh, for me, I can just kind of pinpoint uh, a few things that I look for maybe at each position. Um, I'm a little bit more, I have more of a bent towards uh, rushing quarterbacks in this format, um, just because I think um, the, the rushing yards may not be consistent, but you can get those massive spike games uh, if a quarterback scores a couple of touchdowns. Um, obviously, passing volume is great. Uh, in this particular league with a four-point uh, pass per touchdown, I kind of leaned, that's more of a depressed, uh, what I would refer to as a depressed quarterback scoring. So I kind of leaned a little bit more towards uh, uh, rushing quarterbacks and felt like I was able to grab some of that upside. Um, and then in terms of, of running back, what, what I look for there is I'm, I'm a huge volume snob with, with running backs. Yes. Um, you know, a guy like Tyler Algier last year that had incredible touchdown production, but the volume wasn't there. That is so hard to replicate for so many reasons. And so, you know, I think when I'm, when I'm looking at the running back position in particular, who are my guys that can reasonably touch the ball 250 with the potential 300 times? I mean, and maybe that's nothing groundbreaking, but for me, I'm just not the type of guy that, hey, he's a really good player, but we don't, we don't have a historical precedent for that. Um, I'm chasing volume. Uh, obviously, there's a few schemes in, in college football where, where we know the wide receivers are going to pop. Um, I tend to find a lot of value in a coaching change um, because a lot of people will just look at the raw data from a particular program and, and, and label it, oh, I don't want a South Alabama receiver, for, for example. I mean, that's not a great example because Tolbert had a good year. But uh, I, I find some edges uh, there. And so um, and again, I mean, tight end, tight end's pretty straightforward, but you know, for, for me, it, it's waiting on the quarterback, uh, trying to zero in on guys that are going to be ideally, you know, high volume passing and have rushing upside. But, uh, I just prefer to build out the skill positions early and, and just go ahead and go that route and then fill out my quarterbacks. And then I have a few guys that I think, Hey, these are going to be my sleepers at the end of the draft hopefully one or two of them pop. So I, I don't know if that's specifically what you were looking for, but that's kind of how I approach it. Yeah, no, I was just looking for, for strategies. I'm just trying to figure out if the birds over there are agreeing with you or they're arguing with you, to be no, honest. They, are. They, they, they love it. They're full <laughs> throat. <now. laughs> Eric, what about you? Real quick, philosophy, best fall. Uh, changes, uh, you know, I think it changes somewhat for, for us all, right? For you, how does it change? Well, it's funny. Last year was a, was a strange best ball season because somehow we still tried to pull out uh, a best ball league when you had, you know, every, every team's playing in different weeks. You had different conferences starting in different months, obviously the Pac-12 and the Mountain West. So that was wild last year. And if anything, um, I, I got myself into trouble a little bit by taking too many chances, you know, and I guess just something I wanted to focus on, at least for this particular draft is to make the most I can out of every particular spot. Um, just because like last year I, I played the Purdue QB situation, you know, wonderful. Okay. So I have two spots. One of them's automatically dead, you know? Um, so I, as far as the QBs, I always try to wait as long as I can to take one, unless, you know, the talent's overwhelming. I want to get that QB one. You know, I feel like there's probably five or six guys I'd be okay with taking early for a quarterback. If I don't get one of those five or six, I'm happy with waiting as Kyle kind of did into those middle rounds, you know, round seven and above. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm right there on board with that. Um, and in terms of the, the tight ends, like I said, I, I feel like it's a deep tight end group this year. Yeah. You know, I have Austin Stogner probably in right around the QB eight to 10 range. You know, I have him a top 10 guy. He didn't go to tight end 20 in this draft, you know, down in like, uh, I want to say like round 18, 19. So um, when you have that kind of talent and he's going to be, you know, an important safety valve for, for Spencer Rattler, I, I wasn't too concerned about expending too much capital on the tight end position. Um, but in terms of what I was trying to do with my, my quarterbacks, 
Um, I wanted to get guys, I have six of them, just like Kyle does. You know, it seems like most teams, it's either five or six in this particular scenario. I wanted to get guys, I knew I was getting bites at the apple every week. Yeah. You know, guys I know are going to be tried and true. They're going to be the starters. They're going to be the focal points or at least heavily involved in their offense and, uh, and basically get as many shots as I can. So obviously I took Willis first. Uh, Jakovic at, in the ninth round, Brock Purdy in the 13th round. Obviously, he's a veteran and he, you know, he plays quite often. I mean, he's every single snap he gets. Michael Penix, uh, after ha- hearing a good report that he will be back and uh, ready to go for opening week, I grabbed him. Sam Hartman, Wake Forest, they have the most snaps per year, just about of any team. I think they were like top three last year and they were first two years ago. And then Gunnar Watson for Troy, who had 350 yards passing. Uh, in each of the last two games, or I think he averaged, I think he had like 700 yards in his last two games and uh, they're a pass oriented offense. So to tie that up, I wanted to make sure I, I wasn't taking chances in the back end of my quarterback group. I wanted to get as many bites at the apple as I possibly can and avoid even with the running backs handcuffing, which, you know, you, you tend to, you handcuff too much and you throw away whatever, you know, the second half of that handcuff that doesn't produce. I want to at least try to get as many guys who I felt like um, could at least be involved in their offense. And if they're not, that's fine, but at least I'm not wasting two spots on. Them. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, to, to Mike, Mike's point earlier, you know, you hit in the quarterbacks, uh, you, your chances go up incrementally to go ahead and win leagues like this. And look, I, you know, I, I said, I drafted Emory Jones too. Right. And I'll get into my philosophy there, but I also had Sam Howell. I picked up, Caleb Ellaby from Western Michigan, what, in round 10. I got Michael Pratt all the way in round 18. So I feel like I've got some guys that really can produce. But what I like to do in some of these best ball leagues is I may reach for a guy like Emory Jones now more so than I would in just a traditional best ball draft because what I've done, I feel, by taking Emory Jones is that, one, I've got Dan Mullen, probably probable starting quarterback, which has been proven to be productive over the years. But also what I've done is I've pretty much taken Anthony Richardson off the market too, because who's going to draft Anthony Richardson and waste a roster spot if they don't have Emory Jones. For me, I picked him up, I think in one of the last few rounds, just as a safety blanket, but with the other quarterbacks, I did want to go ahead. And like you said, get more bites of the apple proven starters that are going to be there week in and week out. I think where you get into a little bit more of a strategy is What do we do with the mass fatigues? Trey Henderson over at Ohio State, right? Like that's where you start handcuffing and getting to those situations. Sometimes it depends if you're drafting at the beginning of a draft or if you're drafting in the middle because, you know, you've got to wait for the the draft to snake all the way back to you. Mike, what are your thoughts real quick on that? Yeah, I don't have a ton to add. The one thing that I noticed that I did with this, I out with best ball in particular and in particular with best ball, uh, leagues that won't allow waivers. There are some of those those that uh, occur. Um, I like, aside from my rankings, I always have a strength of schedule heat map next to it. So um, I'm pairing uh, certain players, regardless of position, with uh, another player that has uh, maybe an easier matchup. So for example, um, I had Macaral, who has a week four bye. Now I was looking for another quarterback and I had higher ones in my ranking at the time that were available, but I selected Holt Nailers um, as my third quarterback. Why? Because in week four, when Corral is on a bye, Holt Nailers plays Charleston Southern. Now, Holt Nail- it's week four, so he's not in November yet when he usually pops off. So who knows what he does in, in uh, September. But you like that pairing, right? If Matt Corral's on a bye, you have a good chance that Ailers will be in that, in that spot at, uh, for that week. So um, in particular for best balls that don't allow waivers, I definitely like to analyze the schedule. Yeah, it's a good point. And the one thing that you brought up that makes that, that reminds me of, of something you and I mentioned, uh, usually fan tracks has the bye week updated uh, next to the players' names in the draft room. We didn't have that this year. Fortunately, we had our printed, uh, printed uh, our cheat sheets that came with the preseason fantasy draft guide. And I know some of you guys had that as well. And so we were able to reference some of the bye weeks because you and I put that in the printable draft day cheat sheets that are in the guide, how long Fantrax takes to update it. I don't know. Maybe they have already, but I know in drafts that are going on right now, 
uh, that certainly that they don't have the bye weeks included in there. All right, so let's get to the fun part. We've got some questions now. We're going to get into our sleepers, our bus. We're going to make fun of people's rosters. I mean, that's what we do best. So we may as well do that and get it on video and fire out the first shots. Um, but before we do that, let's 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 talk about this. We all, you know, we've been part of the draft. We know the results. Um, Kyle, we'll start with you again. Any names going in the first two rounds that you're kind of staying away from right now? One or two names that are going in the first round to maybe five, first five rounds that maybe you're a little unsure about taking with, with an early selection? Yeah, I'll, I'll give us a controversial one right off the bat, and that would be uh, B. John Robinson. Um, I, I think for me, I would, I would, I'd have some, some questions about him. I mean, he certainly wouldn't be uh, in consideration for me in definitely the first round. Uh, and I mean, it would be, it would be several rounds probably before I would consider him. And uh, the, 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 the reason, the reason being, uh, I would say it's, it's kind of twofold. The first is that um, I have some concerns about the Texas offensive line after watching that spring game performance. Uh, and, and the second being, if you look when Sark uh, got to Alabama, you know, Najee's season wasn't nearly as impressive in 2019 as it was in 2020 when he was kind of getting everything installed. So um, for me, he just is too speculative a pick. I mean, I love the talent. Uh, I love Sark in general. You know, it's reasonable to assume he could get to 250 touches. But um, for me, when I feel like there's some guys that could get closer to, to 300 touches, uh, he would be, I don't, I don't think he's going to be, he's going to be one of them. So uh, surely that won't, uh, that won't be controversial at all. Well, Mike's trying to keep a straight face over there. Yeah. So, well, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be fantasy football season without Mike and I button heads. And <laughs> here we Mike, are. Mike, what about you? Name, name or two in the first few rounds that you're staying away from right now. Um, my choice, I got two. Uh, okay. The one I'll go in a little more in depth is Ronnie Rivers. Now I have him top. 10. I have him at seven. So obviously I like him, right? Um, for one, the schedule hurts him, especially if your league commissioner does not include week zero, which you want him, you will do whatever it takes to make sure that they include week zero if you draft Ronnie Rivers because they play uh, UConn. Shout out John Lobb. Um, but it's not only the schedule, uh, head coach Kalen DeBoer won. 200 carry running back in the last seven years, one guy to top a thousand yards. Now Rivers would have topped that most likely last year if you extrapolated over the course of the season, um, but he only played Mountain West opponents. Um, he's a guy that I just won't invest um, uh, first or second round draft capital in. Um, Fresno State loves the depth that they have. They, they like Jordan, the coaching staff likes Jordan Mims. Um, they brought in Jordan Wilmore from Utah. So that's a, just a coaching staff that kind of spreads the carries around typically. So Ronnie Rivers, if it's full point PPR, maybe I'll take him in the first two rounds. This one wasn't, it's only half point. So he's somebody that I'm just- Who's your other one? Who's your other player? Oh, Kyron Williams out of uh, Notre Dame. Um, they got the, uh, they added a Marshall grad transfer that should help out the offensive line, but their, that performance, uh, from their offensive line was brutal in the spring game. Um, I know they had a couple injuries. We typically trust Notre Dame to get those, um, their offensive line settled and fixed, but there's just some concern there. I also have some concern with, uh, the backup Chris Tyree. Um, some people are expecting him to make a, a second year jump similar to Kyron Williams. So, just a little scared by that uh, that workload there. Eric, what about yourself? One, one or two names in the first few rounds you're staying away from right now? Sure. Well, just if we're using uh, in general, I would say Kevin Marks, Buffalo, is a guy I have some reservations about given Lance Leopold, uh, the guy who remade that entire program, leaving to go to Kansas and, and taking a good portion of his staff and some of the offensive line with him uh, as well. You know, obviously Jared Patterson's not there to – uh, you know, obstruct him anymore. But with Maurice Linguist, who is a uh, defense-oriented coach, he was the co-DC at Michigan taking over and, um, you know, coming in with obviously a system that with a defensive coach, you probably don't want to throw the ball around too much. So, you know, I understand that. But um, with 
turnover on the line, you know, people leaving by graduation, people leaving by a transfer. Uh, I have real reservations about what the small schools look like when they change over their coaching staffs. I know the talent's not bad. I know that the system's in place for them to be successful, but um, I always have hesitancy with those small schools when they're changing over, you know, full scale of staff like that. Um, when pertaining specifically to this draft, uh, I would say of the, the, all the guys that went in the first, second round, the number one player for our draft that I would not have taken would be Grayson McCall, who Nicholas, Nicholas Ian Allen took in front of DJ Uyangalele, as well as Bryce Young, who then Mike went and took. Um, you know, that was, a, I mean, taking them in front of DJ and Bryce, even in a redraft league, very bold call. And when you're dealing with, uh, you know, kind of philosophically, as we talked about, what I like to do is I have, you know, that, that set six QBs that I feel like I would take in those first two rounds. But if not, I would rather wait. And that speaks to, you know, Grayson McCall going in front of those two and going in the middle of the second round where you could probably get somebody fairly similar, you know, a few rounds down the board. And it's just not going to cost you the opportunity to get DJ or Bryce Young to get them. Yeah, and I'll throw out a couple of names to myself. Um, I, you know, I, it's going to sound like we're picking on Nick a little bit, um, but I'll, I'll, you know, for me, one of the picks I was uh, Chris Chris Rodriguez going at running back eleven in this draft for me might just be a tad high. I know we've got a new system going in there, but it's hard for me to think that they're going to be more run heavy than they have been in years past. And so for Rodriguez to go at running back eleven, he selected him there. For me, it was a little questionable pick, but, you know, the one thing that we mentioned with the first two rounds, it's proven guys. When you look at the guys that were drafted in the first two rounds of our draft, even though Grayson McCall's in there, Eric, the one player name for me, and I mentioned that I like to draft wide receivers early in this draft, is that we have Kayshawn Booty for LSU really high. Right now, number two rated receiver in our preseason draft rankings. But when you look at all the players drafted in the first two rounds, he may have the smallest sample size of any guy that has been proven uh, from last year. I'm not going to stay away from him. The guys that make me a little, that I'm a little more hesitant uh, to draft right now are the Reggie Robertsons at SMU, uh, who's coming back from injury. A little hesitant. I'm even a little hesitant on, and I'm going a little bit farther down the list, the De'Eric Kings from Miami as well, who caught that injury at the end of last year. And I'm just wondering how these guys are going to be able to, to bounce back. So those are a few players that really stuck out for me in the first couple of rounds. Um, let's get into this one though. Looking at the first few rounds of the draft, uh, give me a player or two that you're higher on than most of the group. And this could be a guy coming from your roster because there's a reason that you draft him. Eric, we'll start with you. Any players in the first, you know, seven, eight, ten rounds that you're much higher on than what the group seems to be right now? Yeah, I seem to be higher on Jarek Broussard, running back Colorado, than the rest of the group. And um, I guess it speaks a little bit of, uh, you know, what Kyle had alluded to as well, where I want to get, I want to get carries, and I like backs that are, you know, monopolizing their running back rooms. And with Jarek Broussard last year, uh, new, new HC coming in, obviously there was, we remember what happened with Michigan State where, you know, they, they went and took Mel Tucker out of Colorado. Colorado had to go and find, you know, a last second head coach. They bring in Kyle Durrell. And he, you know, to his credit, brings Colorado who, you know, le loses Steven Montez loses LaVisca Chenault and brings him to a four and two record. Pretty darn impressive, you know, first year coach. Um, so Kyle Durrell comes in and pretty talented backfield. You know, he, he's got Fontenot from the year before who ended up getting dinged up. Then you got Jaron Mangum, who was a, you know, a, a pretty highly thought after, I believe a four-star prep recruit who then subsequently tra transferred out to South Florida um, with a talented backfield he went and gave Jarek Broussard 25 carries in five of the six games that Colorado played last season, you know, and as we discussed, you know, they went four and two, they were successful with giving him that sort of a volume and those touches. So I don't see a reason why that would stop. He had 400 yard games, including a 25 carry 301 yard performance against Arizona. Yeah. Um, so when it, you know, it, it's easy to kind of let these guys who didn't get as much run, who don't have the full 12 games 
of a body of work to, you know, pop out at you. But with Broussard, where he was getting such a heavy, heavy load, game in, game out, first year coach, you know, uh, his, his competition, transfer it out, Jared Mangum. It's going to be his show again. He's going to get a steady, steady diet. And uh, at RB19 is where he was selected in this draft. I, I feel like that's a pretty, pretty solid value. And I have him probably closer to 12, 13 on my list. And, and I know I'm really more bullish on him than a lot of people. Well, I'll give you a little bit more ammo to back your argument as well. Uh, you know, he had a double ACL injury, right? Early on in his career, injured both knees. He played with a knee brace last year. In the spring, he lost the knee brace. He's got confidence in that knee now. So, uh, they say he's looking a little bit quicker in preseason camp. And of course, coming off the double knee injury, you know, maybe he's over that psychologically. And they felt that if he didn't have the knee brace last year, he might've broke a couple of them to the house. I think when you look back at his stats, the only thing lacking last year may have been the touchdowns. But if he's looking fully healthy, psychologically healthy as well, that's a good one right there. What about yourself, Kyle? Yeah, actually, it, can I just piggyback on, on this comment? Because I was actually going to throw something to everybody, but now now while we're on it would be, yeah. uh, and, and I'll maybe if we have time later, I'll ask the question. But I would say Broussard is the player that's giving me the most heartburn uh, out of any player. Um, and, and, and the reason being, especially in some of my dynasty leagues, you know, he was available. And so early on in the, in the spring, I was so excited. I'm going to get him. He's going to be cheap. Uh, he's a, I think he was second last year at 26 carries a game, but I don't know if it's motivational or not. I've read some concerning quotes from the coaching staff. Um, and again, I don't know if it's motivational or, or not, but what, what I am, uh, sort of interpreting from what they're saying is it almost sounds like they're trying to give someone else the job. Um, and again, I don't know if they just know he's the type of guy he needs a fire lit under him, but there's been a few things that I've read uh, in various months uh, throughout the, uh, throughout the, the, the early part of spring and now into summer where it seems like they're trying to give someone else the football. And so um he, he's been a really, really tough one for me. I mean, let, I think... Let's be honest, though. That's a, that's a lot what you, Mike, Eric, all of us struggle with. We have to sometimes read the tea leaves and try to decipher what's coach talk and what's legitimate, right? And so that I, when you're hearing and reading those things, it's, it's really difficult. That's what makes what we do sometimes tough when we're projecting out because we're seeing – you know, we're reading so much, but, you know, sometimes in the spring, you have to wonder, is it coach talk or is it legitimate? And so I feel you right there. I, I happen to fall for me on Eric's side, the fence right now, because, you, you know, he's proven he's done it right. Um, it's hard for me to think that they want to get somebody else in there um, that's better than him. But I, look, I get it. Um, I don't I know if you want to add anything to that. Um, just real quick. Yeah, um, I personally feel that we'll start to hear a lot more of those types of quotes from coaches just for the fact of the with the one year transfer portal ruling. They want to keep their players on the roster. They want to make sure that the guy RB2, RB3 know that they have a shot at getting that starting job, which is part of my hesitation with Broussard. He's had the injury history in the past. I'm a little hazy on that, but um, back up Ashad Clayton, I think was one of their highest profile recruits in school history. He's around, they get Alex Fontenot back from injury. He missed all of last year. He was a productive back, um, 2019. So they have depth and that's where I'm a little concerned with Broussard. Yeah. Is there a player that, that you, you are a little higher on right now than the group? Um, I, I, wrote down Josh uh, Downs from North Carolina, the wide receiver. Um, I haven't seen Eric or uh, Kyle's ranking, so I'm not sure if, if they would have him. I have him as wide receiver nine. Um, I'm pretty solidified in the fact that he will be a top 10 receiver um, this year in, in CFF. Um, I, the slot receiver in Phil Longo's offense is pretty much bulletproof for the most part. I mean, we saw, you know, Daz Newsom cost me quite a bit of coin last year, as most people know, but um, that slot position in Phil Longo's offense is, um, it's, it's foolproof for the most part. Um, I mean, and, just and, and, and you took one off of my list. Obviously, you know, I'm a big downs guy. I picked up and got the Howell Downs connection uh, in that best ball draft. Is there another name you've got for us real quick? 
Uh, I didn't write down one, but I was just going to add for downs. Based on the Fantrax ADP, he's going 71st overall. Um, in our in-house ADP, he's 70th overall. I think he went wide receiver 11 and 12 in the uh, most recent drafts that I went. So I am a little bit higher on, on downs than. Yep. Hmm. Well, looking back at the first 12 to 15 rounds, guys, when you look back at your draft, is there any, and Eric, we'll start with you on this one. The way that it's playing out, the, the way that it played out, will you, and I know sometimes it depends on where you're going to land in a spot next time. Anything caught your eye in regards to philosophy of how things played out that might change your approach for the next best ball draft? Yeah, uh, specifically the running back talent pool. It seems like right around the 10th round, there's a 10th, 11th, 12th round, there was a drop off in terms of talent with the running back. So um, what I'm going to try to do strategically is try to make sure I have four, maybe five running backs on my squad by the time that 10th, 11th, 12th, uh, yeah. you know, rounds roll around. So I can feel pretty good about taking shots and, and kind of going behind, uh, you know, a few guys get it. And, and what I mean is uh, round 10, we had taken Zach Evans, Destin Coates, Demontre Tuggle, who I love. Um, round 11, Traylon Smith, Jalen Mitchell, who's another good shot, you know, over there in Louisville. Uh, Mike took CJ Verdell uh, in round 12, Ladarius Jefferson, Tion Dollard, etc. And I feel like right after that round, you know, uh, 12, I feel it's, it starts getting a little dicey. Marcus Williams, we'll see what happens in Louisiana Tech. Uh, you know, UNLV, Charles Williams, it's just, it's more of a team issue. Uh, Israel Abaconda, Zamir White. Nobody wants to take Zamir White because of Kendall Milton. Um, so you just see the, the question marks with these running backs crop up after that, that solid 10th, 11th round. So um, I think it's going to make me focus a little bit more on making sure I, I get a quarterback in that top 40 or so tier, excuse me, running backs, make sure I get three or four of those guys before uh, I, I have that, you know, the cliff comes and where I perceive that talent to drop. You know, it's funny. I'm sitting here smiling while you're talking, and it wasn't because of anything you were saying. I, I really wish Kyle had some glow-in-the-dark glasses right now. That's, like, the only thing. Like, my goal is to get this show <laughs> to extend in the dark hours so we can't even see him anymore. <laughs> that's, that's uh, what Kyle, what, what about you, man? Uh, anything uh, stuck out to you, trends, that, that might affect the way you draft next next draft? I think I think for me, looking looking back in retrospect, um, you know, I took uh, Michael Mayer in round seven. If there was a quarterback available uh, in that range, because I'm more of a late round quarterback strategy guy, if I felt like there was a guy that provided more upside than the guys I started taking there, the Toon, Slovises, Jefferson, that I felt were a tier above that, you know, I may have swapped into that and then waited a little bit on tight end. I mean, I would say in general, I felt there was there's a lot of good tight ends that didn't go drafted. I mean, guys that could very reasonably be top 20 tight ends. Um, and, and there's always going to be the uncertainty at the position, too. There's going to be guys that we've never heard of at tight end that are going to pop. Um, so for me, I, I think that the, the, the last five picks of my draft will almost certainly look like some form of tight end and defense yeah. uh, and just really not jumping much there. If there's an elite quarterback or elite for my standards in terms of not a guy that's going to go early, maybe pop up there and take them. Uh, but other than that, I mean, I'm going to do a whole lot of waiting on those positions towards the end. If I don't have a top tier tight end, especially where I took mayor in the seventh. Yeah. Good point. Mike, uh, I couldn't wait to get to you on this question. You and I did a two man mock draft amongst ourselves for the draft guy, part of planning. It's a great exercise that we did to give us an idea based on value of how deep the positions are. I'm guessing, and I could be wrong, you used what we spoke about, um, about the running back positions being deep as your strategy going into this draft because you went quarterback, quarterback, four straight receivers, quarterback again. You didn't take your first running back until round eight. You went Anya Smith for A&M, Tyler Algier in the ninth, Verdell in 12th, Corbin 14th. Here's my question for you. Do you think you waited a little too long for a running back, or do you feel okay with where you're at? Uh, 
probably waited a little bit too long. Um, but I, again, these, I, I, I'm comfortable with, with rostering anybody in my top 80 at the running back position this year. Again, it just speaks to the depth at the position. So um, do I feel like I waited a little bit too long? Would I like to maybe draft somebody um, instead of Ania Smith? Uh, probably, um, but, but just, it just speaks to the depth of the position this year that I, I feel comfortable waiting in any format uh, for running backs this year. Sounds good. Well, look, here's a go. We're, we're going to do this again in a couple of weeks. We've got another one coming up, but the fun part of these shows sometimes, particularly for a lot of people coming in, looking to get names are the sleepers, right? And so, you know, I, I, you know, I mentioned to you guys before the show, you know, we don't want to do sleepers that are guys that are in the top 10, 15 picks. Some of those guys farther down the list where guys going into that draft may be able to steal somebody in the 15th, 17th, 20th round. Uh, we're going to go ahead and kind of kind of shoot these out. Eric, we'll start off with you. A couple of quarterback sleepers down on your list for everyone to uh, be, be aware of. Absolutely. I'm going to start off with uh, my last quarterback who was, uh, I believe he was in the 26. Yeah. He was actually Mr. Irrelevant for this draft because I had the last pick, the 26th round uh, Gunnar Watson. I mentioned a little bit earlier in Troy uh, it threw for 697 yards over his last two games. Uh, he had some injury issues, but man, Troy slings the ball around. That's what they're there to do. You know? Uh, and the fact that he's going all the way down at the end of the 26th round almost didn't get drafted uh, you know, for a team that has all five linemen back, uh, you know, has a very experience on the offensive side, plays in the Sun Belt, so they got a great schedule and, uh, and are kind of coming up a little bit this year where they were a bit down last year. I, th I think they're going to be much better, and I think that Gunnar Watson is going to have several 300-yard games under his belt, uh, which, again, speaks to how I perceive the depth of the quarterback position to be. Uh, secondly, uh, this is a guy that I am extremely high on and I didn't even take him and I wanted to see if he went. And, and when I went back and kind of looked everything over, I was like, all right, I, I have to mention him. Uh, Carter Bradley, quarterback Toledo. Uh, I mean, Toledo was down two years ago, came back last year, you know, Jason Candle, I mean, an, an absolutely excellent offensive mind. He was the offensive coordinator there before he became the head coach. Uh, you know, they were down a little bit, but they're restocked. Their team is loaded. Okay. They got probably the best wide receiver core in the Mac. Uh, most of their offensive line is back. They, you know, you're talking about two years ago when they had Logan Woodside and he threw for 39 touchdowns and 4,000 yards. That's not out of play. And with this team, you know, like I sincerely feel that you could have a quarterback, be it Carter Bradley, who has is kind of the incumbent or uh, Daquan Finn, who is, you're pretty talented and is going to get a shot to win that job. It's still kind of up in the air a little bit, but I'm, I'm going with Bradley here. Whichever one of those quarterbacks ends up, you know, firmly taking that job, they're going to be a potent fantasy relevant uh, quarterback. And I'll leave it with this. Last year, Toledo, ninth in the nation in terms of passing yardage per game. Top 10 quarterback. I mean, top 10 in the nation passing offense their quarterback didn't even get taken in 26 rounds uh that's something you want to be mindful of and i won't be letting carter bradley go and the next one that we do i'll let you know that, that much uh, for sure mike a couple from you uh one that me and you joe disagreed on to start and i'm pretty sure you knew that i would bring him up today is juan mathis from temple okay um hardly ever do i advocate any player in a, a Rod Carey um, offense because he's just a shit head coach. But uh, if you look back to his time at NIU, um, his quarterback one averaged 136 carries per season between, excuse me, 2014 and 2018. Juan Mathis um, has dual threat abilities. I, he gets a bad rap because of that first half that he had, um, you know, on the road against a pretty good uh, Arkansas defense in the opener, his first career start with a, a wacky off season. I know he looked bad, but I just, I saw the potential there, a dual threat in Rod Carey's system, typically uh, boasts some uh, decent fantasy numbers for you because of the rushing ability. And you can basically get them for free. So that's, I would, I, he's been somebody that I've been snatching up for free in, in, in dynasty because he's a, a redshirt freshman. I believe. And then 
Uh, so we'll have plenty of years of eligibility left, uh, but in redraft as well. Um, second one I selected was, well, I should just say North Texas QB1, but I selected Austin Ayu um, just because he's the starter for now. Uh, we'll see what happens when uh, Jace Ruder, the North Carolina transfer, gets on campus. But that rotation last year between Jason Bean and Ayun threw, threw for uh, 2,800 yards and 28 touchdowns. Um, if you can settle on one, if the coaching staff at North Texas can settle on one guy, I know they don't have um, Jalen Darden this year, but if they can settle on one guy, you are going to get uh, fantasy relevant numbers there. So, And he went in the last round, I believe. Kyle, real quick from you, got a couple of quarterbacks for us? Yeah, two guys that I took, uh, KJ Jefferson from Arkansas. He was the 29th quarterback in round 11. Uh, again, just uh, having a Bryles quarterback, one with dual threat ability like him, uh, throwing to bet one of the best wide receivers in the country, really like his potential. Um, and then another quarterback that I took at uh, the QB 36 in round 16, uh, maybe a sore, a sore subject name for fantasy owners who have played for a number of years, but Lane Hatcher, uh, from Arkansas state. I, I think now that he has that, uh, that job to himself, um, they threw the ball 42 times per game last year. And that's, that's going to be top five volume, uh, almost year over year, uh, unquestioned. And, and I think one thing that people forget about Lane Hatcher, he actually was committed to Alabama. Uh, he was an Alabama quarterback. Uh, he, he, he it was one of those things where, uh, again, if we're, if we're going down a, a, a little bit of a rabbit hole, we're taking a few uh, doses of psilocybin here. There's, there's not a, uh, there, there, there's, there's a reality in which it wasn't Mac Jones last year, you know, that did what he did. It was Lane Hatcher. So, I mean, a quarterback that's going to throw the ball around as much as he is. Um, uh, I, I like him with that type of volume at QB 36 when he's finally got the room to himself. James Blackman doesn't scare you off there. No, not, not really. I mean, I think he's a quality backup. Um, I mean, the staff there, they've showed they've gone to guys, but I think James Blackman sort of is who he is uh, at this point. Um, so uh, not, not, not too much. And at that price, uh, it, it's, it's worth the shot. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't ask James Blackman to, to do some of the things in terms of just like a vertical passing game like they run. I think, he's, I think Hatcher's the guy. But yeah, it's a valid point. So let me address a couple of things real quick while we're having a little fun with this. Eric, uh, what you mentioned about Toledo being ninth in the nation in passing, Mike and I talked about this a lot when we were doing projections. We had to really be careful with those guys in the MAC because they played a MAC-only schedule last year. And a guy like Demontre Tuggle, right? I mean, the, he played against Akron and Bowling Green, two of the worst defenses in the MAC conference. So some of those MAC players we did have, uh, trouble projecting for those reasons. And also, Mike, you and I have gone round for round with DeWan Mathis. My point was, he was a deer in the headlights in that opener last year against Arkansas, and they brought in Stetson Bennett, who looked like the popcorn vendor out of the stands, who looked better than him. And so that was, you know, we've had a little fun with that. Kyle, I'm agreeing with you. Here's my short list. Holton Aylers this year, East Carolina, looking for a bounce back year from him, lost a little weight, looking a little quicker in camp. Spring reports are good for him. Jake Bentley, we touched about South Alabama offense, but where I got Jake Bentley in the 20s for this best ball draft, I find is great value in that major Applewhite offense. And I wrote down Lane Hatcher as well. I know that Logan Bonner's gone. Mike, I know you mentioned that that Bentley, uh, that Blackman is right there. But guess what? Guy had a 19 to 2 touchdown to interception ratio last year. 10.6 yards per attempt was fourth best in the nation. There's a lot to like him, uh, alike about Lane Hatcher. Real quick, in a, in a more of a more rapid fire fashion here, uh, Kyle, running backs, give me two names, sleepers. I'm going to go with um, the transfer from South Carolina, who's now up in Corvallis, to Sean Fenwick. Uh, so you've got an SEC back filling in the profitable role that Jamar Jefferson was just in. Uh, I took him as RB67 in round 18. Job isn't his, but I like a lot of the, the reports out of camp, and I was like an SEC player going up against a uh, – glorified g5 out there in the pac 12 uh and then lastly uh kaylin griffin uh from rice uh, i took him as rb83 in round 24 uh they get a new offensive coordinator this year they're actually incorporating some vertical passing but it looks like the running volume will still be there because bloomgren's a stanford guy uh, in the spring game he had 17 for 125 and i've actually followed his career he'll be a true sophomore this year um the staff's raved about him so i think he could be a 
potentially a 250 touch guy that I got in round 24 behind 80 other backs. Mike, quick two running backs from you. Yeah, I chose uh, Jalen Mitchell out of Louisville and Tyler Beatty for Missouri. Um, if there's any two systems that produce 1,000 yard backs on a consistent basis, it's Eli Drinkwitz and Scott Satterfield. You can get Eric, you can Eric get two quick points. names running back. Uh, sounds good. Uh, L.D. Brown for Oklahoma State. He was the 86th running back taken in this draft. We've seen Oklahoma State year after year after year. Mike Gundy produces big-time running backs. We saw last year, unfortunately, Chuba Hubbard got a high ankle sprain, and it put him down. L.D. Brown came in, ran for 100 yards, and then he got a uh, you know injured. And in came Desmond Jackson, who was you know, third string, just a, a pretty unheralded three-star and he went wild as well. So it's just a matter of whoever's going to get the carries in Oklahoma State. You want to have a piece of that backfield because they're going to be an effective running back. And they're going to be generally an RB2, RB3 on a weekly basis. Uh, lastly, my second one, uh, I tend to like Rashad White, Arizona State, a little more than everybody else. Uh, I took him at uh, RB27, or excuse me, I, don't, I didn't take him, just somebody took him at RB27. Uh, I think that's a pretty darn good value for him considering – how explosive he was last year. Now I know they got Chip, uh, you know, Trey Adam there. Uh, obviously, it's a case where they're a slow offense, but um, you know, with Rashad White, the explosiveness, the tape he put on. I mean, he he looks like he's yeah, I believe ready he to the nation go. yards. I think he led the nation yards per carry last year. Yeah, yards per carry. I mean, gosh, and out of the backfield, gosh, he's deadly. If you get him in space uh, out of the backfield, catching passes multiple long receptions last year. Uh, so I feel like the, the all purpose ability is being slightly undervalued. I think whoever got him at RB 27, I got a pretty good deal. And so I went with Micah Bernard, Utah. I know we've got Chris Curry, TJ Pledger there, but I really like what I was reading out of Bernard out of spring. We know the system, Andy Ludwig's offense. If Bernard can do it all, supposedly he's got hands out of the backfield. He can run. He's got all the tools. I like his upside there. And then my second running back is Britton Brown, UCLA running back. If you give me the start and running back in a Chip Kelly offense, we know he's going to feed his horse. If Britton Brown stays healthy and can kind of stave off Charbonnet, I think you've got a, a, a running back there that's much better than where he's going in the rankings. Receivers, real quick, Kyle, give me two. I'm going to go with Utah State's Devin Tompkins, a new Arkansas State uh, offense out there. So there's a chance someone could catch 70, 80, 90, 100 balls. Got him as wide receiver 67 in round 17. Uh, he had 13, 250, and two combined through the final two scrimmages. Lastly, grabbing what I believe will be Josh Heifel's wide receiver one, always very profitable in Jalen Hyatt. Uh, I didn't get him, but wide receiver 72 in round 19. A lot of potential. Mike, two names, receivers. Uh, Jair Shorter out of North Texas. I think he's guaranteed to get double-digit touchdowns this year. Uh, the second one, uh, I know you, Joe, and Kyle seem to be high on South Alabama. I would suggest Colin Lacey um, in at Major Applewhite system. I believe he's targeted the slot. Not saying he's going to be wide receiver one. I wouldn't say that over Tolbert, but uh, 58 receptions and seven touchdowns typically from the wide receiver two. So I like Colin Lacey. Real quick, Eric, two names, receivers. Yeah, Mike wishes he could make a trade uh, for Colin Lacey. I know in one of our dynasty leagues. Uh, uh, wide receiver, Hassan Bedoun for Eastern Michigan. He went in the 20th round. I didn't take him, but he went in the 20th round. PPR, he's an absolute machine. He had at least six uh, receptions in each of his six games last year. And uh, usually he's going for a lot more. And we saw a couple, I believe his last two games, he had double digit receptions. Doesn't, I mean, he's not going to score many touchdowns, but for PPR purposes, I mean, he is as high a floor as you're going to have for a wide receiver. So if you're, even if he's catching 10 passes for eight, 80 yards and no touchdowns, that's 18 points in PPR. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, I'm going to go with an undrafted wide receiver, Treshawn Holden, Alabama. Uh, he looked great in the spring game. I think he had nine receptions. He had to be probably about 12, 13 targets. It's up for grabs who the wide receiver two is going to be in Alabama. I saw that Jamison Williams went fairly early in this draft. I want to say maybe like around round 13, 14 or so. He went, excuse me, round 11. He went to Nick. God, Nick's taking a beating in this podcast, isn't he? <laughs> um, so, uh, I, I mean, he's just getting into town. You know, I think that you see the potential of that number two wide receiver in Alabama with Dick Williams getting taken in the 11th round. I think with – 
Holden, who held it down, you know, he was the incumbent going into the spring, and then he held it and did looked great in the spring game. Bryce Young was all over him. I, I think he holds that job. It should at least be drafted that way. If you're going to draft Jameson Williams in the 11th, you should at least take a shot at Treshawn Holden sometime in the 20th. I've got quick names. You know, I mentioned that I was a little hesitant on Reggie Robertson for, for SMU. I actually think I like Danny Gray this year. I think we might have been one year ahead on Danny Gray. I like him this year. I like Caffrey Brown, North, North Carolina wide receiver. Uh, I mentioned I like Josh Downs. I got that whole entire passing game in the best ball offense. I got Caffrey Brown. Josh Downs and Sam Howell. I think we didn't hear a lot about Caffrey Brown because he missed most of spring. And then I also have Kevin Austin, Notre Dame. He should be back this year. He should be healthy. And in my opinion, immediately steps into that wide receiver one role at Notre Dame. And I think where he's going in drafts right now, you're going to get him in very valuable spot. I think he's going somewhere like around wide receiver 50 or, or so in the draft. So good value there. Hey, look, guys, thanks for coming in. Thanks for joining. I think if there's one thing we may have given Nick some a lot of airtime, maybe not to his liking, but he'll have a chance to redeem himself. Thank you guys for participating in the best ball drafts. I know we're going to do it every two, two and a half weeks. So we're going to get you guys back at some point throughout the summer. Um, we like guys like to add something real quick before we go 30 seconds each. Kyle, I'd starting with you. I'd just like to say, uh, Chris K gave me a lot of grief last year for taking Jamie Newman in the third or fourth round. And I would like to go on the record and state that he was a better pick in the third or fourth round than Chuba Hubbard was as the first overall and Jamie Newman opted out. So I just want Chris K to know that there's only one King in Atlanta and he's sitting right here in the dark. Mike, you got 30 seconds to close it out, man. Now Chris is going to take a beating. We said we were going to take shots. I don't know who Chris K drafted, but his team sucks. That's my parting shot. <laughs> Eric, 30 seconds. Well, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm interested to know that Chuba Hubbard went one overall last year and I got L.D. Brown at the end of the 25th round. So I guess I guess that's not bad value. It speaks to kind of what I was going with Oklahoma State. Uh, thanks for having me on, Joe. Obviously excited to see what you and Mike with this collaboration, the CFF site, uh, what you guys have for us going into the season. Obviously love the product and can't wait for the next round. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining. We'll talk again soon. See you.